Well, welcome to Rev Reads. I am privileged today to have another author interview. We are talking to Kyle Mann, the editor of the Babylon Bee. And I'm sure most of people who are watching this video know about the Bee. It is the most popular satirical news website in the world. And so they've been putting out tons of great material. I did a review on their Babylon Bee's Guide to Wokeness, a book that I, I highly recommend and uh, thought was just fantastic. And today we're talking about their latest book, which is the Postmodern Pilgrim's Progress. So thanks, Kyle, for coming on and discussing your book. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. Uh, quite the introduction, and I'll try to live up to it uh, and, and be as interesting as you make me sound. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you get you guys have gotten gotten huge lately. I remember uh, oh. I, was still, I was following Adam when he put out the first post saying I'm going to do something crazy and yep. you know start with satire. And so I was, I guess, I was there day one with Babylon Bee's first story, and it's just the way you guys have grown has just blown me away over the last couple of years. Yeah, well. Um, and, and that's how I got involved with Babylon B was I followed Adam Ford's uh, reformed web comic that he did. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, you'd never think something like that would turn into the, you know, giant cultural phenomenon or whatever you want to call uh, Babylon B, at least something that speaks to wider culture, you know, but yeah, I saw his, um, I saw his post and I emailed in cause I, I, I had a similar reaction to you. You know, I, <laughs> I, I saw this thing and I, and I go, this is incredible. This is everything I ever wanted in my life. And, uh, <laughs> and so I just started emailing in articles and that's how I got, that's how I got involved. So you were just cold emailing him articles and he connected with them. Yeah. I, guess. Yeah, I, um, the, I don't know if you remember the one, it was one of our first big viral hits was the, um, Holy spirit unable to move through congregation as fog machine breaks. Oh yeah. It was like yeah. Our, our first big viral hit. I sent that to him the day the Babylon Bee launched. And then the next day he published it and then he emailed me back and he was like, you know, I have gotten thousands of really crappy submissions and yours was good. <laughs> Send me another one. So I did. And then I started, I was working at construction sales job at the time, um, which, you know, has nothing to do with what I do now, but I, uh, I started uh, like in the morning, I would get up and, and write three or four articles, email it to Adam. He'd publish I don't know, two thirds of them, three quarters of them. I, I had a pretty high uh, batting average, but, um, uh, but I didn't like, I don't know. It was an interesting creative process. I wasn't, um, I wasn't like running pitches by him and then fleshing out articles. And there was very little back and forth with Adam. Like if he didn't like an article, he'd just ignore you. Um, <laughs> if he did like an article, he'd publish it, you know? <laughs> And uh, I, I don't know, that's that's kind of, uh, that style really worked well for us. So a lot of the Babylon Bee for the first few years, the, the tone and the style and the voice that we cultivated was my writing uh, filtered through Adam's hunches, you know, like the stuff that he was yeah. like, that's going to do well, that's not going to do well. And we just worked so well together, uh, just you know, o over vast distances, just emailing each other articles and, uh, and, and, and editing them from there, so... So you went from construction sales to telling Christian jokes. Um, and I guess your thing was always you have three or four good jokes and you package them in different ways uh, to all of a sudden saying, you know what? I'm going to look at the second best-selling book uh, of all time. Uh, problem, I mean, this is probably the best-selling Christian fiction of all time with Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. And I think I'm the man to update it for today. So how do you get to the point where, where you and, and Joel working with you say, you know what, we're going to tackle the Pilgrim's Progress? Because I would assume I would think if anything would be, maybe I shouldn't touch that. It might be the Pilgrim's Progress. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, we're much we're much better writers than John Bunyan, so that's why we decided <laughs> to do that. <laughs> I yeah, I mean, there's obviously like you know, there's a danger that it looks like hubris to be like this is the this is the better modern version of uh, of the classic work. Um, so I guess I'll say we have immense respect for Bunyan, and this is not supposed to be Bunyan, but better. Um, this is supposed to be an homage and a uh, um, kind of a, I, I, I'll, I'll say satirical twist to Pilgrim's Progress, but it's not satirical in the sense that we're just making fun or we're just being lighthearted or 
or we're making fun of Bunyan. We took Bunyan's general framework of um, this dream within a dream type uh, format that he has where he thought, I think at the beginning of um, Pilgrim's Progress, he falls asleep in his, um, in his prison cell, really. And then um, has a dream of, of uh, Christian, you know, traveling on the road to, uh, to the celestial city. And um, so that general framework we borrowed, we borrowed for the second act, all the encounters that our protagonist Ryan hits, you know, that's that format that Bunyan um, hit upon was so great where you just, you, you have, you, you can string readers along from encounter to encounter. And it's like, oh, I recognize that guy. And, and, and it, it makes it, it makes it a bit of a page turner, you, you know, even in the original Pilgrim's Progress where you're going through and you're like, oh, that was so interesting, or that was so true. Or personally, I think there's like, um, there's a lot of humor in the original Pilgrim's Progress. Um, and just in that, <laughs> you know, just in that uh, Christian is constantly wandering off the road or um, you know, he's, I, I always thought it was funny that he's talking to guys whose names are things like, you know, Mr. Idiot or whatever. <laughs> oh, no, and, that's one of the best like, parts of the humor of the book is he's talking about these people. And then he complains like, oh, I can't believe Sloth is lazy. Yeah. Like, yeah. like, that's one of the sort of funny parts of the book. <laughs> he's like, you know, Mr. Idiot let me off a cliff, you know, and you're like, well, yeah, you shouldn't have listened to Mr. Idiot. You know, so we played, we played with a lot of that kind of stuff in the humor um, you know, I think there's an, in our book, there's an encounter with Satan a, a couple of times, you know, and he's like, well, I, you know, I think our protagonist says something like, well, you're, you're, you're Satan. I probably shouldn't listen to you. <laughs> you know, that was kind of, that was kind of our, uh, our, our, our wink and nod to the way, uh, how on the nose Pilgrim's Progress is. But yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I go on the book, uh, interview circuit to promote my book, but, you know, if people aren't that interested in the sci-fi twist or the multiverse thing or the weird, uh, humorous angle like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, then, you know, if people just go out and buy the original Pilgrim's Progress or read it free online, you know, it's free everywhere. Uh, that would be that would be a good outcome, too, I think, because it has been such an enduring classic. It's one of my favorite books, maybe my second favorite book. So when I was reading it, I felt like the biggest change sort of right off the bat is changing from the the narrator being the guy who had the dream. He's telling his own story. This is the dream I had and, and talking about. So it's basically Christian telling Christian's story to you decide to create a narrator who I'm not really sure is if it's an alien or an angel or a what. Um, so what was the idea behind changing the narrator from being the actual main character of the story to a new character? Why did you decide to make that sort of, I think it's a big shift in the book. Yeah, well, um, the, the idea for the narrator came about because I had written a draft that was more one-to-one -one, uh, with the original Pilgrim's Progress. And you do run into that problem, like that first question you asked, where it's like, why am I reading this when I could just be reading Bunyan? <laughs> and uh, uh, it was, and there wasn't, there wasn't much humor in it. You know, it was very like, like, I think I even took lines from the original Pilgrim's Progress and just slightly updated them, you know, and the first line of the book was that, um, was that line that, uh, that Bunyan has in the, in the opening where he says, like, you know, and, and I dreamed, was it a man with a burden on his back or, or whatever. Um, I, I, um, I got my co-author Jill Berry involved uh, fairly late, like, um, well, this whole, this whole draft, the published one is, um, it is all me and him together. But once I had kind of done a lot of that other draft, I put it in a drawer for a couple of years. And uh, I revisited it last year when we were starting to go around pitching the Babylon Bee Guide to Wokeness. And um, I was thinking about it. I was like, I wonder if we could, I wonder if we could get this thing to see the light of day. So I brought it to Joel and I asked if he wanted to help me finish it. And, um, you know, we were reading through it and he had the idea to do this narrator character. Um, it's, it takes a lot of inspiration from, you know, Douglas Adams, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, uh, jokes that have kind of uh, stories within stories like um, uh, Princess Bride, uh, a, a Terry Pratchett kind of Discworld sort of vibe when it comes to the, uh, comes to that kind of satirical uh, commentary throughout. Um, and the narrator really gave us this opportunity to, uh, to make a lot of these kind of asides to break the fourth wall to inject a lot of 
Babylon B style humor in there. Cause like we're, I, ran, I ran into this problem where like, you know, people, a lot of people are going to buy this book because it's, it says Babylon B on the cover. Like it, you know, Kyle and Joe Barry, Hey, they're the guys behind the Babylon B. Um, and, and if it was too dour, if it was too serious, if it was too much, if it borrowed too much from the original program's progress, you were going to end up with a lot of confused customers, you know? Um, so we really wanted to, we really wanted to inject this, this layer of humor. And, and, and that start that started to become one of, one of my favorite parts is this narrator is kind of this, like you said, it's an angelic type of figure. We didn't really specify if it's like an angel or, or who he is, but um, you know, he's, he's been around for hundreds of thousands of years or, or whatever. And um, he's kind of like confused or, or bemused by humans. He doesn't understand what's um, what motivates people. And he doesn't understand why God loves people, you know, <laughs> and it, not that he's opposed to it, but he's, he's interested and it. it's kind of that like things in, in, what is it that uh, le- angels long to look into you know that was kind of the the inspiration for that guy so hopefully it's a lot of fun we uh <laughs> we added tons of footnotes and they were kind of divisive you know <laughs> people were like i have to keep i have to stop reading to read all, all these footnotes but they're funny so i have to stop and <laughs> oh i i liked the footnotes i think i think the book would not have been good without the footnotes uh i was a little torn on the narrator early on um, I found him to be at times annoying early in the book. Um, but then as the book went on, I don't know if I warmed up to him, um, but I liked him more as the farther the book got into it. Um, so it was it was an interesting pick. And so, um, yeah, no, I, I said in my review of the book, I pictured Max from The Flight of the Navigator in my mind when I'm reading this book, whenever <laughs> yeah. the Navigator comes in, I picture that kind of robot arm alien face like coming into the story and telling me his you know take on what's going on yeah and the and the narrator does um kind of take a back seat as it goes on you know he'll inject himself back in here and there but um but yeah once we kind of establish that voice that you know you have to let the reader know like there can be these moments where the fourth wall gets broken and i think early on in a book you have to like clue people into what the tone is and how far you'll go this way or that way when it comes to the the language and uh we establish that early and then you can just pull back and then we can just do little hits throughout so yeah i mean if we ever do a movie version or a show version you know you could get ron howard from uh <laughs> arrested <laughs> development to do your <laughs> your commentary throughout <laughs> Uh, so, and one of the things you talked about the tone of the book and about how it might surprise people and the tone did surprise me a little bit, even with the levity that was in it, because it, it gets a little deep. And I think the topic that probably surprised me that you covered really throughout the book, not just in like one city or the one location is, is grief is sort of in the book from beginning to end. And I was just wondering, um, cause I don't, I didn't see grief as an overall theme in Bunyan's work. So I was wondering why you ended up going down that path, um, in grief. And maybe if you had any insight for, for Christians who are going through grief and might approach this book. Yeah, I think, you know, and that's kind of where the title comes from the postmodern pilgrim's progress is, um, the guy that's going through this journey isn't actually a Christian, um, and I think he's a little more representative of um, the spirit of our age. You know, um, I think in Bunyan's day, you know, in Bunyan's day, you did have you did have atheists, and you did have kind of you did kind of have Enlightenment characters starting to pop up, and um, so you ha- did have humanism and all that. And he and and Bunyan deals with a lot of those themes. Um, you know, he does have the what is it, the Castle of Despair, and um, themes of suicide and and all that uh, in the book. But it's not the main thrust because I don't think that's what the culture was struggling with. I don't think that's what he saw, you know, in his churches and stuff was, you know, it was I don't know. It wasn't people really questioning the existence of God so much. And that's what we have today is like the, um, the, the atheistic arguments, the secularization of America is what we're dealing with. Um, and so we really wanted to, to make a main character that people could relate to, whether Christian or not, that this is a guy who's like, I know what religion is. I know the gospel. I know who Jesus is. Um, You know, I have family members who are Christians, but eh, it's not for me. You know, um, there's too much evil in the world uh, for that to make any sense. I've kind of gone beyond that. Um, And so we made it real personal for our protagonist with the death of his brother at the beginning. 
Um, and then that's kind of the, yeah, the, the monkey on his back that he keeps having to fight off throughout the story is, um, you know, can't, when it, when people die and it seems like it's for no reason at all, um, can you, can you keep taking that one step forward and trusting that God, God has ordained or allowed that, um, for a, for a, a greater purpose that there's, there's an author who's writing a story and you don't see, you don't see the end of it because you're in the story. Um, I think that's a, that's something that we struggle with both at, at, in the wider culture and in the church, you know, it, it's, I, I don't know, the, the, the discussion between God's sovereignty and free will and is, you know, how much has God ordained and how much has he allowed or, or is he in control? You know, those are like, those are fundamental questions for humans that we've been grappling with for, for thousands of years. And uh, so for our guy, yeah, it's the question is like, does God exist? And if, if he does exist, is he just a monster or, or can he be good despite suffering? Um, so that's kind of a core theme that we keep coming back to. And that's, that's the main character. We, you know, we have a lot of different encounters where the guys encountering um, fun characters and interesting characters from the church, but that's the main question and the crux of his, his journey as, uh, as the hero's journey is, can I, can I say that evil exists and yet God is good at the same time? So um, hopefully that's something that resonates with people. I know, I know grief is something that's big and I know, I mean, even as Christians, you're not, <laughs> you're sorry if I'm talking too much. Um, yeah, fine. <laughs> yeah uh, e even as Christians, you know, grief, we're not insulated from it. And uh, a lot of Christian art and a lot of Christian works tend to shy away from the, the difficult questions, because then as the author, if you pose a difficult question to your character or a difficult challenge, then you have to answer it. <laughs> and, you know, we prefer that we prefer that our Christian fiction or our Christian movies just be like, the Christian guy doesn't really have any doubt. He has to come some kind of external challenge and he then debates the atheist character and, um, and the atheist gets hit by a car and dies and the Christian goes to a newsboys concert and everybody's happy. You know, that's like the, <laughs> that, the not to get too specific, but that's kind of the, um, the bent of our Christian art, you know, a lot of times is that we don't, we don't let our characters ask tough questions and we feel like we have to put a neat bow on everything. So I don't know. Hopefully that kind of answers questions. Um, oh, I guess you asked about, you know, advice for Christians struggling with grief. I don't know if I'm the main guy to, to answer that question, but you know, that is the theme of the book is to keep moving forward, to take that one step more. Um, I, I, I think too often in the Christian life, we expect um, great things or we expect, um, you know, these epic struggles and, you know, we want to be radical Christians out on the mission missions field. And that's great stuff, of course, but Oftentimes, all we can muster out is this like weak, pathetic, you know, <laughs> ordinary faithfulness. Like, you know, I, 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 you know, grew. I went to Bible college. It's like I wanted to be a missionary, and I, and I, I didn't. That didn't happen, you know. <laughs> and now I'm like, uh, is God happy when I am struggling with depression and doubt and fear, and and I happen to um, struggle mightily to get the family to church on Sunday, you know? That's like, that's the struggle that a lot of us are going through. And that's kind of what we wanted to emphasize. So, yeah, no, it's clear in the book that some of the most difficult times for Christian are not, you know, the, the big set pieces that are sort of built up and the major conflicts, but just the, the plotting, mm -hmm. um, the taking the next step. And so you really see that throughout the book. So um, as, as we were saying earlier, the sort of the genius of Bunyan's work in the original Pilgrim's Progress was that he was going from interesting character to interesting location, from interesting character, whether it's the interpreter's house or the castle of despair, you know, he's got all these sort of really intriguing places. And you would expect from the postmodern Pilgrim's Progress that you're going to update those locations. And for the most part, um, the majority of the book is updating those locations. I think the updates get more pointed toward today, the farther you go along in the book, would that be an accurate representation? Yeah, You're more sure. in line with Bunyan earlier on. Yeah, absolutely. And some of that just comes from the writing process that again, that early, those early drafts, I had a lot of fleshed out early chapters that, um, that were like one-to-one, -one. like I'm going to, like I have Bunyan's book here on this side of the desk and I have my manuscript on this side and like, you know, okay, what are we going to take, you know, what satirical twist are we going to do on this? And then as we wrote it, it, it became clear, this is its own thing. This is not, um, this is not just an updated version of Pilgrim's Progress. 
So let's just take the framework, and as we go on the story, you get uh, you, you know you get more updated. But I also think, uh, you know, I think narratively that works for me anyway because it's like. If you know Pilgrim's Progress, you're you're comfortable in the beginning of our book, and you're like, okay, I'm tracking. And then we throw a curveball when you hit Act Two, um, and then you start. We, you know, we have one one of the early encounters after you because uh, a Bunyan has the the City of Destruction, and then the the Swamp of, of yeah. Despond or the Slough of Despond. How do you say that? Um, and so we do that. Like we basically have one to one representations of that, and then from there, it's pretty much we're not reading Bunyan's book anymore and saying well except again the river at the end and the um and the uh uh the the golden city the celestial city yeah. uh and there's also a kind of a, a, a homage to um uh, vanity fair and everything that happens there in uh and I guess the castle of despair too so there are things but they're moved around they're not put in the same spot they're uh you know we try to do some su surprises but when you hit act two we get right to Chesterton's fence which is was a very fun section to write because I, I always I always wanted to write a short story where it was like Chesterton's fence and an actual crowd of, of, of people that want to pull down the spits. And if you're not familiar with Chesterton Spencer and any of the list, listeners aren't, Chesterton had this um, essay he wrote where he said, um, you know, two types of reformers are walking through a field and they come upon a fence. And the modern reformer, which he would have seen as the moderns um, in thought, we would see him as postmoderns. But they come up to the fence and they say, let's tear this down. It serves no purpose. And then the conservative reformer says, um, if you can tell me what the fence is for, I might allow you to tear it down. <laughs> and then he says, if you can't, then we should probably go away, figure out what it's for before we decide to do anything with this fence. You know, and it's this great commentary on traditions and how um, reform can be necessary sometimes but we need to know why we're reforming it. So in our version of Chesterton's fence that Ryan and his companion Faith come upon us, they walk through this world as they see this fence and there's these protesters pulling it down and they're like, the fence is evil, you know, it's a bigoted fence, down with the fence. You know, and they ask him, well, what's the fence for? And they're like, we don't know, you know, we just have to tear it down, it's a fence, it's restrictive, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and then of course, all horrible, sorts of horrible things happen. We have a character that kind of represents the health and wealth, prosperity gospel, um, that offers them healing. You know, uh, we have a one of the my favorite sections to write is we have this city that's literally a big bubble, and it represents kind of the Christian bubble that we get into, especially like in um, in Bible college and and as we as we go through our you know mega churches and like kind of that insulated, comfortable world of Christianity where we haven't actually gone out and confronted the horrors of the world, but we just stay in our in our little bubble and we never. Um, so we have so we have this town of people that are talking about how they're going to do great things for the king one day, but all they've been commanded to do is walk to walk the road to the Golden City, but none of them ever leave, you know? <laughs> so, there, so there's a lot of fun uh, things like that. And then, yeah, from there, it just it just continues to get further and further from Bunyan <laughs> as we go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, my uh, Evangelion, so the, the city of Evangelicals and Erbia, I thought that those were the two best chapters uh, from my perspective. I felt like they hit hit home the hardest. Um, like, I mean, I'm, I'm a, I'm a pastor who reviews books and you talk <laughs> in Evangelion about people who read books about the Bible, but you can't find a Bible anywhere. <laughs> um, and I'm just like, oh man. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, and then there's the, the, the pastor that's, you see in Evangelion, he ends up coming back later. Uh, in the series. I don't want to say mm -hmm. how, because I think it's uh, it's something that I don't, I don't want to give away. I want people to discover it for themselves while they're reading it. Uh, but you, those are, those sections were really convicting to me reading it. Um, and I was wondering if you had a part that you thought, man, this either hits me home, or I think this is going to hit home to the most people in the church. Like, did you have anything that you felt was, was really convicting that you were putting in there? Yeah. I mean, you know, writing a book is such a different process than than writing the satire that we put out every day. Because, you know, when you write satire, you're like writing something that you f you feel is true or you feel is really funny or, you know, it just makes a good point or it's a good quip. And we write what's true to us and you put it out there and then you instantly get that audience feedback. You know, you get retweets or likes or shares or whatever it is. Um, and then it's either like, oh, this is a massive hit. Everybody connected with this. 
or it's like, ah, that one was kind of a bomb. No one enjoyed it. But but I can still go, well, I enjoyed it. You know, <laughs> I don't really care if you guys liked it or not. <laughs> but um, with a book, you know, you're poor, you're trying to write things that are true to you and then or and, and true to an objective reality reality, and you throw it out there and then you hope that people connect with things, but you don't really know what's gonna hit. Um, so like something like Evangelion, like I don't know. Like I'm writing what's true to my experience and I don't know if that's going to resonate with anyone, you know, so that we don't have marketing meetings where we sit around and go like, I hope, I hope, or, or like, what, what what is, what is everybody out there going to connect with? And then we try, try to write the story to match. We write what we, what we feel needs to be said and then hopefully people connect. So it's, so it's great that, that those things resonated with you. Um, yeah. Urbia was written by my, my co-author Joel for the most part. I, we sketched a lot of it up together and, and we punched each other's writing up, but I think he wrote most of Urbia. And that was really important to him to have this um, uh, kind of takedown of, you know, the great sin of our age of humanism, um, you know, and that's taken from a lot of different places as C.S. Lewis's abolition of man and and really what the secularists want with our society. Um, and so, yeah, the city of Erbia, we have this like ziggurat and it's like this monument built to man. Um, and I don't remember how explicit we get in the book, but the the kind of uh, feel that we wanted is that Ryan and Faith can see the golden city in the distance. And then as they go, um, you know, they get in the Valley of Doubt and then they see the towers of um, Erbia and it's like, oh, we're here. We've arrived at the golden city, you know, but they're not. They're at this kind of uh, satanic mock-up of the golden city, <laughs> you know, that mankind says, we're, you know, we're going to build heaven on earth rather than going to this uh, heaven that's across the river. Um and so that was a lot of fun. And then obviously we address a lot of the sins of our culture in that. And then the past, I mean, the pastor character to me was uh, very personal for me. I had, I, I've experienced a lot of people in my life that, um, and th this is a question we ask a couple times in the book, you know, with pastor, with the faith healer, like there are good things that these people do. And these people are, are massive influences on Ryan and Faith's journey. And then later on, we see like that, you know, were they, were those people faithful in the end or were they actually even believers, you know, <laughs> yeah, later on? And I, you know, I don't know, like, that's just kind of a question that we ask. It's a vague, like, you know, God can work through imperfect people and God can, um, God can work through people that later on, you know, maybe it shakes your faith. Like if you ever had a, a pastor in your life, who's fallen into sin or, or, a, um, or you follow, you know, you followed a false teacher for a while and you're like, oh man, like, <laughs> like this is crazy that this, you know, I got the gospel from a false teacher. You know? uh, so we were kind of asking those questions as, a, as we went on. Um, I don't know when I go back and read, sorry if I'm answering too long again. Yeah. I did an interview yesterday and the guy go, I, I answered the first question and I, I tend to just kind of talk and uh, podcast hosts tend to like it when you talk a lot because they don't have to talk as much, but um I interviewed a, I, or I interviewed a guy interviewed me yesterday and I answered the first question and he goes, you can stop talking now. <laughs> oh. I'm like, Oh, okay. Brutal. <laughs> My fear so is always me. that I'm talking too much. And like, cause I'm assuming they're coming in and watch this to see the author that I'm interviewing and I'm over talking on that author. So if you talk, I'm like, um, I'm assuming they don't want to hear from me anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, I don't remember what I was talking about, but um, yeah. Oh, the parts that I go back and read through and just feel like resonate for me are like the end of the story to me um, where Ryan has kind of learned all his lessons and it all kind of focuses in on and zooms down on, um, you know, him just having to take that one more step. I think that's a powerful part. Um, there's a moment, there's kind of a moment with the cross um, in the middle of the story or, or uh, as we get kind of close to the third act of the, of the story, um, there's a moment with the cross that I, that I like. Um, it's a little vague. Um, I think you had a question about that actually. So I won't, um, I won't step on that too much, but, um, uh, that, and, uh, yeah, yeah, probably all that would be stuff that I enjoy. I, I, I like, I, I, as a, as an author, I tend to go through and write like, the big exciting parts. So I wrote a lot of those, like the cross, the, the crossing of the river, the golden city, um, the, the, the last chapter, the beginning, like I wrote all that very early on. And then I was like, okay, now we have to write a story to connect all this, <laughs> to get people to these fun, big moments. 
Have you had any feedback so far that maybe you guys went a little too far in any of the chapters? Anybody been like, you know, that, that might've been, you know, too much guys. Um, have you got anything that you went, maybe you went a little too deep in those points? Um, the, uh, the publisher, um, <laughs> the publisher uh, had us change a few things before it got to, for before it got to print. So they probably protected us from some of that. But there was a few characters in there that you can probably tell if you're in the no, in the know on mainline evangelical culture. Um, you can probably tell are based on some real characters, uh, some real people in in real life. And so there was, so there was some. Uh, there was some editing done where we we broadened characters a little bit to kind of represent an entire movement rather than a specific person. <laughs> and maybe that's good for avoiding lawsuits. I don't know. But um, but I actually liked that feedback from the publisher because it was like, not only does it make it less like you're picking on one guy and uh, but but it also um, it also means that it's, the story is more accessible for people who don't know exactly who you're talking about. Um, so like, you know, to me, I write somebody and I'm like, obviously this is talking about, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, but they're like, you know, then the publisher's like, who is this? Like, who are you talking about? <laughs> and you're like, oh, okay, I guess not everybody has the same, uh, you know, experience that I have where they know exactly who this is referencing. It, it's a lot of the inside church humor of the Babylon Bee where we have targets that we enjoy to pick at. But if you're not aware of those, or you're not like way into the, the, theology bro culture <laughs> you might not know who they are so that was uh that was and then uh gk chesterton makes an appearance during the chesterton's chapter and a lot of like the publisher didn't know didn't recognize the reference i like, didn't understand um, who we were talking about and i thought it was being very i thought it was too on the nose describing gk chesterton <laughs> so we had to like do a couple things to frame it better so people could understand uh who was making the cameo appearance there <laughs> Oh yeah, no, I guess, and I guess because you changed it. And I was about to say it was very obvious in the in the real book, you know, who you were who you were referring to in the final copy. So, uh, yeah, no, that was definitely uh, that was definitely on the nose uh, there. So I'll come now to my biggest complaint in the book, uh, the thing that I was most critical about that I would have liked to have seen in the book that you sort of held out, and that is the king's son is not talked about, um, and I would have assumed that. Probably there would have been more mention about the king's son. You talked about the point on the cross you thought was poignant. And even when you come to the cross, uh, you don't like, like here, I, I made sure I took it directly from the book to see what you said about it. You wrote, uh, he saw a man dying on a cross, falling into darkness and emerging again, triumphant. I mean, I would have liked, uh, you know, something about the man being the king's son. Um, or maybe Faith telling him about that being the king's son. So I'm just wondering, what was the motivation behind not making that more explicit in that moment? Yeah, um, well, uh, some of that goes back to what I was talking about with, um, with Christian art, you know, always having this desire to be very didactic and instructive and on the nose, like, you know, we want the character to have the altar call moment or the um, the very clear, like step into faith moment. Um, and so, you know, yeah, it, it could have gone that way and maybe the book wouldn't have been any the worse for it. But I think for my personal taste, like I, I like it when art asks questions. Um, and obviously we as Christians have answers. So we try to provide a lot of, um, pushing people in the direction of the answers in this book, but it's not, it's not supposed to be like, um, you know, very on the nose, like, like we have a salvation moment and then, and then there's a, a line at the bottom of the page that you can sign and send in and say that you got saved too. <laughs> so we're trying, we were trying to avoid that, um, that element. And then as far as like not talking about the King's son or whatever, like, I think the idea of this world is very much that it's this, you know, we kind of dip our toe into this multiverse idea that there's this, um, there's this, host of universes that are all singing the, the praises of the king or the praises of, of God. Um, and it was a kind of a direct answer to a lot of the multiverse fiction that's out there right now, like everything everywhere all at once. And even though that wasn't out yet at the time, but we we had seen this in other, in other stuff like Rick and Morty or 
um, you know, there's this idea that there's this multiverse. So uh, even like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy has a little bit of this theme, like uh, nothing matters. So make today matter, you know, or like, so just love people. And, and uh, that's, that's the meaning of life. That's how you create meaning is by loving people, you know, and we, we wanted to kind of do a direct response to that and say, there's all these, you know, what if God created other realities, they wouldn't be nihilistic realities that didn't praise him or didn't sing his glory, you know, and so that's, that was kind of the idea of this is that there's this, there's this disparate, like, like just random universes. And every time you dream, like you dream a crazy thing of a cat with laser eyes attacking you, like there's a real universe out there that <laughs> does that, you know, and I know, I, I think even um, the new Dr. Strange, bizarrely, like, so this stuff wasn't out when we wrote this book, but the new Dr. Strange plays with that, that there's like, you know, you, if you would dream, you're actually, you're, you're another self in another reality. Um, so to get back to your question, um, you know, the idea isn't really that like, you know, Jesus came to this reality too, and he's the son of the king in this reality, and he dies in this reality for these people. You know, it's almost like there's this weird parody mirror image of our universe in this other universe where the people are living out, you know, what the gospel is, um, in, in, in a physical way and not so much like, um, like our battle is spiritual, right? Well, their battle is physical in their universe. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, you know, say, you know, we could have done something where we, we, we developed that a little more and said like, well, he's, he's the son of the King and he came, you know, I, I don't think I wanted to mess around too much with like Jesus came and died in another reality or he's, you know, like, I don't know, you get into some hairy theological waters there. So we did kind of want to leave it vague that there it's kind of an allegorical universe that's this alternate reality. Um, and then, and then, sorry, again, if I'm going too long, just tell me to stop. But um, um, that moment too in the book, it's obviously a reference to Bunyan where Christian's burden falls off his back and it goes down into the crack and, and, uh, and it's never seen again, which is just a powerful moment in, in Bunyan. Um, but we didn't want... But I don't know that Christian or that uh, Ryan is actually get saved at that point. Like in, you know, and I think we even make an explicit point that it's like God had, has started drawing uh, Ryan to himself at this moment, but, but there's not like a, this clear specific salvation moment of, yes, I believe at this point. And often like, I think Christians, we believe that there's a, we believe that there's a moment of salvation. You know, you talk about the Ordus, Ordus Salutis and like, you know, there's a moment of faith. There's a moment where you are, you were not saved the moment before and you are saved the moment after because you believe. Um, but, and I don't think that's that moment for Ryan, despite like seeing the cross and feeling a burden lift off of him. And it's almost like he's seeing this reality of what could be in his life, should he believe in our, in our world. Um, and he kind of takes the first step towards that at the end of the book. But again, I think I think we wanted that to be this kind of big, like a picture where we as Christians go, oh, we know what's happening here. But Ryan doesn't know yet. He's not he hasn't emerged yet. He hasn't like taken that step of faith yet in the real world. Um, and if he's just in a dream right now, but he wakes up and he's like, there's something new in him where he all of a sudden has this desire to um, to learn more about God and maybe to start to grapple with his questions of doubt in the real world. And sometimes that's how God works. You know, sometimes it's like the Holy Spirit is working on us and and he's creating faith in us and it's like there is a moment where we where we believe but there's also this long process like c.s lewis wrote about you know how god was the god was the hunter and he was the deer you know <laughs> and it's like god was stalking him all his life um so that that's kind of the that's kind of the the idea there and i can understand i can understand if people wanted it a little more spelled out um so yeah uh but if you don't like it, you know, just go read the original Pilgrim's Progress. You get you get the more explicit version there. <laughs> well, no, I like I read yours and I think I think I read that section like three times. And I was like, because I'm trying to figure out what you're what you're, you know, playing at. Because I'm like, is is he getting saved? And I'm like, ah, is he believing? Uh, I, I don't know, because, you know, I, I think belief in as it's presented in the scripture is very much, you know, it's it's faith in in Christ, faith in what he did. We're trusting in him to save us, not ourselves. And I'm sort of hard to see faith in that. And then I went back and I, I read um, the first half of Pilgrim's Progress like a week ago. Um, and uh, it, 
like Bunyan was super explicit. And that was one of the things I wanted to go and double check to see how explicit Bunyan was in comparison to you. And I guess you are right. If you want explicit, you can go back and read Bunyan. Um, but I do like your, your explanation that, you know, this is all a dream. And um, this is, how, how long did they say this dream took in the beginning of the book? <laughs> it was, it was three, like four seconds. Yeah, it was a uh, 2.8 seconds or 3.2 seconds or something. We made up a random number, so. <laughs> yeah, so something, something like, like less than four <laughs> seconds. So uh, yeah. obviously he still needs to believe in the real world and he needs to come to faith in Jesus. So I guess that makes more sense. I wasn't thinking alternate reality in that, you know, I wasn't. So I, I guess I, I get what you're saying from your perspective, because I wasn't wasn't thinking multiverse. Uh, <laughs> you know, when I was when I was going back and looking at that that section in that portion. So I kind of understand what you're saying. Uh, but I would guess I, I would like to throw this out. Um, do you think um, how big of an impact might it have been if you made a theme running through the book of he can look at the fact that Christ walked the journey before him? Um, about what that might have changed in the book. Do you do you think that there might have been, I guess, maybe more hope in the book if he could have said, like if he kept encountering characters that said, oh, the king's son walked this journey before you and could continue to look to the fact that, oh, somebody did go before me as the trailblazer, which is as the kind of language the New Testament brings. And now I can follow because of what he did before me. Sure, yeah, I mean... <laughs> It's it's tough to it's tough to an, to answer questions that are like, you know, you could have done this or you could have done that because you know there's there's an infinite things we could have done and then you know you when you're writing a book it's like there's a you know it's like the block of marble and you just chip away everything that's not an elephant you know that's kind of the that's kind of the process so there's a lot of like digging up themes and themes that occur to you as you're writing. Um, it, you know, it's actually, it's even a struggle with the original Pilgrim's Progress. Like I, there's, there's been some kind of hardcore reform people that like get mad at, at the original Pilgrim's Progress because, um, you know, because if you read it, you, if you read it too, like too much in a literalist way, you know, um, I think, I think a Christian gets to the cross moment earlier, but it's still like he's walking the road before he's gotten to the cross. And so there's a lot of people that get like, that's not a lot that, you know, not, not very many, a few annoying loud people. Um, do they get annoyed because Christian doesn't get saved like right in the beginning and then goes on the narrow road? Um, so, and, and, and I think there's something similar here where anytime you're going to do allegory, it's going to fall apart. Um, <laughs> cause you're going to go, wait a minute, he's not even a Christian. How is he even doing this? And, that's kind of that's uh, there's a similar there's a similar issue with Bunyan's book, and that's why I think as the readers we have to go into it going, oh this is allegory it's gonna it's gonna play with things it's gonna it's literalizing things that were not meant to be literalized so there's gonna be some goofiness and that's okay it's like when your pastor gets a sermon illustration and you're like wait a minute that breaks down because you know <laughs> because William Wallace dies at the end of Braveheart or whatever uh, but you you're so yeah I think I think you have to kind of go in knowing that there's limits to allegory where um yeah you're not going to be able to like uh do everything i think we did i think we did try to get the element that you're talking about like yeah we never specifically we never specifically talk about like the reason that christians can walk the road is because christ did um before us and because um you know because of his like yeah and again this is like it's like the book can't do everything where um, and I, I'm not trying to sound defensive. I, I, I completely understand what you, where you're coming it's from. It's your book. I, Defend it, man. You can be I, defensive. I, yeah. <laughs> if I succeeded defending this, you have to buy 10 more copies. Yeah. But um, no, I like, you know, the, the, the imputed righteousness of Christ, you know, like that Christ walked this road. Therefore, we have his the full credit. You know, even in the in, even in the original Pilgrim's Progress, it's like, why is why is Christian walking the road and like, um, why does he have to cross the river and get to the, and get to the celestial city? It's like, if he died, he'd be in the celestial city. Right. Yeah, <laughs> you know, so, yeah. so why is he still, you know, so there, there's the questions like that where you're trying to be didactic and instructive and at the same time, trying to tell a good story. So you're always, you're not always going to get everything in there. Um, I, so I, I, I think, um, <clears throat> I think in terms of the obedience to Christ, like the, um, the elements that we tried to get in there were the book that they discover at the beginning 
which you know you can say maybe had some of that instruction in there um it, the book that had it that, and, and then there was like moments in the story where they they encounter evidence of pilgrims that had gotten gone down the road before them so i think that's the element of like that there were people that had been faithful to that point but again it, it all breaks down right because like um you know if depending on how you want to look at it there's like like what you know you you could look at this book as being super legalistic like oh you have to keep walking or you're not a christian you know? <laughs> like and that's that's the struggle too in the scriptures is like there's this crazy paradox where paul's like run the race uh you know he in the book of hebrews the author of hebrews is like you know you better be faithful or you're, or you're not going to be saved anymore <laughs> like there's language like that you know and, and and i'm not saying that once saved always saved or, or the perseverance of the saints isn't a real thing but it's like, what does this mean? Like, it's there's a paradox where you are saved by grace through faith. You are, um, you are, are forever Christ. You know, you're forever in Christ when you're the moment that you believe, and yet you are commanded to keep walking. And there are dire consequences if you don't. Like, there's those both of those concepts are in Scripture, and so uh, you know, trying to walk that line in allegory is difficult. And uh, hopefully, hopefully we may, hopefully we manage to do something that makes some sense. <laughs> No, you are right. And I, I, I get what you're saying. Um, and I mean, there are, you know, obviously dire consequences, even if you don't need to go to hell um, for those dire right, consequences. Right. So, um, but I, another question thing just popped into me, something in the book that I had wondered about, and um, I hope it's not going to throw too much. And I wonder if you have an answer for it. The book talks about how no one finished the journey before mm -hmm. they, they talked a couple of times in the book about how, the significance with Christian or Ryan finishing the journey was that no one had actually gotten all the way to the end before. Is there a reason that you did not have any other pilgrims ring the bell, I think was what you said, um, before him? Yeah, so that the challenge as we started to write this was that from a narrative, so again, this is the tension between faithful allegory and narrative, is that you're you have no real skin in the game, right? Again, like if if Christian died, or in, in Bunyan's uh, Pilgrim, Pilgrim's Progress, if Christian died, he'd go to heaven. So there's not, you know, but but Bunyan is really leaning into like, this is just an instructive um, yeah. book about the Christian life. So he doesn't really have to inject that narrative tension. <laughs> Although you still feel it when you read Pilgrim's Progress, um, you still want him to succeed and get there. Um, so we had to say, like, is there something in this world that is pressing um, that, that, that there's a there's a time mechanism like you have, you know, if we don't get here, then X, you know, that's kind of the that's kind of how you do a, a good adventure story is like we need to we need to get the MacGuffin and get it to the spot to beat the bad guy or <laughs> to beat the big bad. You know, that's kind of like you have to have something in that. And of course, as allegory, that breaks down at some point, you know. So we wanted we had this concept of this particular uh, place in the multiverse, this particular reality. Um, the way it's set up is um, this land is dying, and the king will return someday. But someone has to ring the bell to awaken him. And of course, we play with that and subvert that at the end. But um, and nobody's made it so far. So um, and then we have this concept that like the city of destruction is like this respawn point in a video game where there's like a uh, you know, as as people keep dreaming in other universes, they keep popping into Christian's head and like and taking the journey, um, but nobody's made it. You know, so um, I, I think we did kind of want. There was some commentary just on how hard it is to to be faithful and how um, and just how you know there are people, there are a lot of people who fall away, and whether you want to say that's you know somebody who was not saved in the first place, you know, as an explanation, or or that people fall away from the faith. Um, I lean, I lean in the former camp that these are people who who just, you know, weren't Christians in the first place, but, um, you know, that, that, I think that rings true for a lot of our experiences in the Christian life is like, I, you know, I, you go talk to people from your Bible college and they're like, oh yeah, you know, I don't really go to church anymore. <laughs> you know, and you're just like, wow, like the, it feels lonely out there, you know? Um, so that was kind of the idea is that we wanted to make this point about um, how, how few will, how few will end up walking the narrow road. But yeah, we're not making some larger theological point that like, you know, nobody actually makes it or something. <laughs> no, no, I, I think one of the things that I, I think is helpful about allegory in the way you did this book, though, is like you said, you lean toward the 
they probably weren't Christians to begin with. I lean toward the Christians can fall away. Like it's just, it's something that happens. You can believe in Jesus and then, you know, fall into a sin or a temptation or a laziness and it'll just distract you away and be a, be a Christian, but, you know, mess up so badly that you ruin your life. Um, and so one of the things that's great about allegory is that you don't need to paint on the wall. This person was never saved for both sides to still get the lesson, so to speak. And that's one of the things I appreciate about this book. Right. And that's, you know, you can talk about that with several different theological debates in the book, like the Calvinism and Arminianism thing. You know, we, ha that was another area we shaved off some edges where like Joel, my co-author is a little more on the Arminian side and I'm a little more on the Calvinist side. And, and we had a couple more explicit lines in there. And we, we kind of just said, you know what, <clears throat> no matter what our personal takes on this are like, let's, let's, let's leave it at the end. You know, we kind of leave it more mysterious where it's like, you know, I, I, I don't want to spoil too much, but you know, the, the kind of explanation for a lot of the suffering and pain that, that Ryan goes through is like, you're not meant to know that, you know, <laughs> I'm the, 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 the king is writing a story and you're part of it and how that interacts with your will or your choice or, you know, um, uh, like, and I think Chris or Ryan asked something like, what if I never ring, what if I never rang the bell? What if I never made it, you know? And then he's like, well, uh, your, your, your job was to be faithful. You know, your job wasn't to be the hero. Your job was to be faithful. Um, and I, so I think that's kind of like, a lot of times we get involved in these the theological debates like Calvinism and Arminianism. And we're sit we sit there in our little ivory towers arguing about it. And it's like, dude, you know, those, you know, those are great debates. Obviously we've had them throughout the centuries and it's important for us to try to understand theology and the nature of God. But at the same time, it's like, how, how is that going to change your ordinary faithfulness that you are called to today? You know, like, I, how is that going to change how you love your family? And maybe it does. I mean, I, I think if you have a robust theology, like that should affect the way that you live. But at the same time, you know, there, there's an imbalance where if you're pushed that way all the time um, and you're not being faithful in your life, then your theology is just, you know, crashing symbols or, or clanging gongs or whatever. <laughs> now, that's actually one of my favorite moments in the book was when, you know, he's like, you were just to be faithful. And uh, I, I really, I thought that was a, a good, good moment. The book surprised me in that you had a lot of good moments for what was a update of the bat update of Pilgrim's progress by Babylon B guys. You wouldn't expect as many poignant moments as occur in the book. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I love, like, I personally just love fiction and I love reading good stories. And uh, J.R.R. Tolkien has this concept called you catastrophe where, um, it's just the inverse of catastrophe. Like in a, in a story, all hope can be lost. And then all of a sudden, all hope can be found. You know, um, that's his concept. If you read Lord of the Rings, you know, there's the moment where Gandalf is staring down the Witch King and the Witch King crosses the threshold of, of, uh, of Minas Tirith and Gondor. And it, it, the first enemy to ever break the gates of Gondor. And it's like, all hope is lost. And Gandalf's just staring down evil. And, you know, Gandalf's basically about to die <laughs> again. And, uh, uh, the, the horns of Rohan blow in the distance and Rohan's arrived to save the day, you know, and I love those moments. Cause it's, you know, it's the ones that just make, give you goosebumps and make you stand up and go like, you know, yes, like there is hope in the world. And I think our, our, our environment of fiction, um, has become so bleak and gray where we want like the morally gray characters and the chaos and the constant cycles of chaos and order, you know, you read, you read George R. R. Martin and it's, and it's just like, you know, just, there, there, there's no ultimate salvation. It's like the best the culture can hope for is like a steady ruler who will, who will maybe hold the country together for a few years, you know, <laughs> and there's just, it's just bleak and depressing. So we needed these moments of like, yes, there are terrible things in this world, but there's also hope and there's also goodness and there's objective reality out there. And there's a God who's in control of it all. Yeah, and I, I think you guys hit it well. Uh, and again, like my review was, uh, just to, to recap, because I want people to get your book, is that um, it does start in sort of a, it feels like a paint by the numbers, uh, you know, retelling of Bunyan's book. And when it started like that, I was like, oh man, I hope it does not stay like this the whole time. And, but you guys really, I mean, amp it up the farther that it goes, you get deeper, you get more critical of modern Christianity, which I think we need those type of criticisms of the church. Um, I'm probably one of the minority who likes 
your religious satire more than your political satire. Um, Cause I mean, if you look at your articles, I mean, do you have the stats? Like how much more do your political posts get spread than your Christian religious posts? Well, it was, it's a bit of a, it's in a bit of a flux because obviously early on, you know, we were hitting big with the Christian crowd. Um, and that's the stuff I enjoy writing. You know, I, I love, I wasn't really into politics much. I, I like, uh, I like writing the Christian stuff, but, um, but the political stuff started getting shared, like Ben Shapiro was sharing it on his page. So that, so a large part of our audience kind of became that um, interested in the political stuff. So we'd throw out one or two a day that were kind of to, to hit that crowd. And then we'd keep doing the Christian stuff. And that's still kind of what we do. We do a, a few Christian posts, a couple of everyday life jokes, a couple of political jokes. Now um, we try to keep it a good balance. Sometimes we probably stray one uh, too far to one side, but um, yeah, the political stuff, when that hits, it, it's just a much broader audience. You know um, it's just an audience that's going to share that and it's going to, you know, get go on Snopes and get fact checked and people are going to be talking about it. And um, the Christian stuff doesn't hit as well, but, but there are times like we, we find when we write really good Christian satire, like it still can hit a fairly wide audience, like be almost up there with the political posts in terms of reach or readership. Um, as long as you're writing stuff that's good and, and that's, you know, that people feel like it has the ring of truth to it. You're going to, you're still going to find that audience, even if it is a smaller target. Yeah. Cause, um, cause it always, cause occasionally I'll see people who will be like, they'll, they'll critique the Babylon B and be like, you know, it used to be good when it was, you know, going at Christians, but now it's all political. Mm -hmm. And I'm always just like, do you actually read the Babylon B regularly? <laughs> like it still does the Christian stuff. So um, I'm, I'm, I mean, it's just to the point where I feel like the political shared so much more that people don't even realize you still do the Christian stuff. Yeah. There's, a, I mean, there, it, it's a both and thing. I mean, you know, we did kind of, tell every worship leader joke you can possibly tell, you know, so, <laughs> so there's an element where the current events are just a, just a, a more of a gold mine in terms of content. Um, but at the same time, the Christian stuff just doesn't get widely shared. So you don't see it, you know, so people, you, you'll, if you don't follow the Babylon Bee, you'll only see what people share in your newsfeed. So if that's the big political post, then yeah. that's what you're going to see. You're not going to see all the Christian stuff. No, your, um, your top 10, benefits of female pastors um recently my my 10 year old son thought it was the best thing you guys have ever done the uh <laughs> she brings orange slices uh and uh gatorade to the to the messages he just uh that the next day at church i think he went and told everybody about uh oh, no. why we need sorry, to have man. women pastors and it was oh, that's it was so that. funny uh, yeah yeah i liked the one i was like you don't have to listen to her <laughs> <laughs> yeah no it was great. Uh, was that was that your handiwork or was that? Uh... Uh, I think. So the the list type articles um, are the most collaborative type things that we'll oh, do. I guess that, yeah, that would make sense. Yeah. So it's like someone will someone will come up with the idea, um, and then everybody will kind of pitch in for it. I'm so I'm looking on my I'm looking on my. Um, my little history here. I think that maybe was my idea. And then, and then we, uh, and then everybody threw in jokes, you know, so that's kind of, those are the, those are kind of the most fun ones to write because everybody's, everybody's throwing in, uh, everybody's throwing in jokes. <laughs> yeah, no, I, no, I was told my wife at my 10 year old son, Isaac just happened to be sitting there and he like, he just, uh, he thought it was a riot. Uh, he like, he loved it. <laughs> <laughs> probably wants women pastors now so we can have snacks during the sermon if it uh if it goes too long so uh no it was a great one um but, but again so um i guess i was off track on what i wanted to say just my overview of the book on why people should read it you're probably going to expect the postmodern pilgrim's progress to not hit hard uh to not have those sort of biting critiques and things that will convict you of how you're not walking the christian walk but it, it hits well um i thought it was covers a lot of the Christian life. It does it, I think, in a great way where, again, you're not wrestling with those. Is he really a Christian? Is he not a Christian? Um, what will this mean if he fails or if he loses? But it's just covering those areas where, you know, we've gone too far in the, you know, postmodern deconstruction critical road or the slippery slope chapter was really good as well and the importance of just trotting the path and not going down those easy, easy slopes that so many people often do. So I thought the book was, it surpassed my expectations by the time I got done with it. 
Uh, I was glad that I had read it. And I'm somebody who I've read Pilgrim's Progress. It'd been a while since I've read it until I reread it, half of it for this interview, but I probably read it two or three times. Um, so I was familiar with Bunyan's work. So I liked the homages back to Bunyan. I liked the updates. So I think this is one that I, I highly recommend. And so I just want to thank you and Joel for what you did in writing this book. I, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. We really appreciate those kind words. <laughs> so no, it was, a good, it was a good work. So if, if you have not gotten a chance to get your hands on the postmodern Pilgrim's Progress, uh, put it on your read list, uh, go out and get a copy and uh, make sure that you're reading that. And uh, what's the next book? You guys have another one that's upcoming that's coming out, right? Another guide. Yeah, the Babylon Beat Guide to Democracy is coming out in September. So we're excited about that one. It's going to come right, right before midterm. So we're hoping it's a timely hit like the Wilkness book was. <laughs> yeah, so well, I'm looking forward to that. No, I got a, I got an email from uh, Salem uh, telling me, you know, get ready for uh, the next one that's coming out in September. So uh, I was excited to see that you're putting out another guidebook because I really liked uh, the Guide to Wokeness. I, I was pretty much laughing the whole way through that one. So... <laughs> Well, thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah, you'll you'll quite enjoy Guide to Democracy. Then it's honestly Guide to Democracy. We um, the first book, Wokeness. I, I love it. It's an awesome book. But we did it, we were on a bit of a time crunch. So some of the art, if you flip through it, is like clearly you know clip art that we kind of like quickly modify. In the Guide to Democracy, we had an entire art department that we just kind of discovered already within our company. People that had artistic talent. And they um, they did custom drawings, custom graphs, custom everything, and it's it's incredible. Uh, you, you, your eyes will pop out of your head when you look at Guide to Democracy. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, so that'll be coming out in September. But right now, it is the postmodern Pilgrim's Progress. If you've read the first Pilgrim's Progress, I think you will get delight out of the way that they've updated. If you haven't read the Pilgrim's Progress. Um, I don't think there's any reason you need to read the Pilgrim's Progress uh, to take stuff out of the postmodern Pilgrim's Progress. So I recommend those books. And if you're new to the channel, I would love for you to subscribe and be a part of the Rev Reads YouTube family so that you can stay engaged in the current and not even current, but past world of Christian literature and what God has out for you today. So again, thank you, Kyle Mann, for your time uh, with us today.